I've been using this commercial workbench and it's okay, but it's definitely not wide enough for the type of cabinets that I usually build. It also has way too many dog holes in it that are spaced too tightly together. And it's just not as sturdy as I would like because it doesn't have a lot of weight to it. So today I'm gonna build a workbench that's gonna solve all those problems and it's gonna cost less than $150. I'm Brad from Fix This Build That. Let's build something awesome. The biggest cost in making a workbench is material, so to keep it down, I'm gonna be using some Southern Yellow Pine, which is construction grade lumber for this build. It's gonna allow us to have a nice thick solid top, but the downside is that as we start ripping this apart since we have wider boards, it may start to twist and turn on us. So let's cross our fingers and hope that doesn't happen. So all of these boards were 12 footers, which I have cut in half because this is the material for the top of the workbench. I do have two different size boards here, two by tens as well as two by sixes. Now I really just wanted all two by sixes, but the quality just wasn't there. I could only get so many. And so I had to go to the two by tens because what I was looking for is to really have a nice edge on the boards because I'm going to be ripping them down the center and then folding them up. And so that edge being clean is going to give me a nice clean top with as little defects as possible. There's a lot of different options as you go down the lumber aisle between sizes and types of wood. Now, right off the bat, you might just be thinking, I'll just grab some two by fours because they're cheap. Well, that's not usually a great idea because they have a lot of small knots in them. And also those edges can get really gnarly at times. And then the color of them is gonna range from this pale white in the white wood up to this really splotchy pink that you'll see in some of those, which I don't even honestly know what that species is. So what you wanna do is head to the back of the store and go where the large construction grade lumber is. So you're two by six to two by 12s, because typically those boards are gonna have much fewer knots, even though the knots will be larger because they come from the bigger trees. Now you can get them in lengths anywhere from eight foot all the way up to 16 foot. Then you can just go through those boards and pick out the ones that are the best, no matter what size they are, because you can figure out the cut list to make it work for you. And if you've been a good woodworker, maybe the Wood Fairy will have brought you some nice straight boards with no knots in them at all. Although they may just have some surprises waiting for you inside. <laughs> that did not take long at all. I was uh, about, a third of the way through my second cut and it started bogging down on me and that takes a lot because this is a five horsepower table saw if i look down here at the back i can see that the board is pinching the writhing knife so i've had this happen to me before and i'm going to put some shims in between the wood to try to just open up that gap so it's not closing down on the blade hopefully i will not have to do this on every single board uh, but yeah the joys of working with construction lumber I've got my big section of boards now and I'm gonna do three separate glue ups. And that's because the total top is gonna to be 36 inches wide. And I wanna be able to plane each of these individually. So I'm gonna do two sections of nine boards and one section of 10 boards. So I'm gonna sort through the pile, just looking at the defects and I wanna make sure that this top is as clear as possible and that there's no defects showing on the outsides of those glue ups so I can have a nice clean face on the front of the workbench. All right, I rigged up a little extension table here to the side of the bench so that I can have the full length of these boards. I kind of wonder, like, do you think the bench knows that I'm making its replacement on top of it? Cold. All right, so I'm gonna dive into the glue up and uh, there's a lot of surface here to apply glue to. Uh, as I go through, I'm gonna clamp these to the boards because I don't wanna wait to push everything together until I get all the glue down because uh, it might start tacking up on the front side before I can get to the back. So wish me luck here. We're gonna jump in and see how it goes. That was not nearly enough. And that was probably far too much. This is not going well. Gotta go faster, gotta go faster. Oh, don't do that. Oh, why are you doing that? Stop. Oh my gosh, this is a disaster. Uh, oh. Okay. 
That was way more hectic uh, than I expected for sure. I've done much wider glue ups and bigger, but it's traditionally been wider boards with thin edges, maybe one inch. So having that wide extra surface here makes this a lot more difficult. And the other culprit and the bigger one was using the wrong glue. So I was using just the regular tight bond original. So for this next one, I am gonna use the tight bond with the extended set time. Um, I've even heard people using epoxy. But uh, yeah, that was a kind of a disaster. But for this next one, we're gonna change it up and hopefully it'll go a lot better. Oh boy. Now one thing that you should definitely watch out for is if your boards do start to kind of crook or bow, then that can show in the glue up. And so I had some boards here that were a little wobbly and that meant that the center was lower than the sides because it was teetering on this center clamp. So I went ahead and I used my electric handheld planer right here on the center. You could obviously do that with a handheld planer as well. And so now it sits nice and flush. Now there are other boards that were cupped so the center was up and I did the opposite there. You could also use some clamping calls on the top and the bottom to help try to get them into alignment because anything that's off, you're gonna have to plane that all down and it's gonna make your top a lot thinner and I wish I hadn't done that on the first glue up. That'll do. All right, I've got a couple of the glue ups here and what I need to do now is get them all to the same thickness and make sure that they're completely flat on both sides. Now wrestling these monster slabs around was no easy feat and it was giving my planer all it could take. Now that is a 15 inch planer and if you have something smaller you may have to go to actually four sections versus three like I did. And speaking of feet, you want to make sure that you protect yours because if you drop one of these slabs you could break a toe or a foot and that would be no bueno. I've been an ambassador for Timberland Pro for three years now and they have a great selection of safety boots and shoes. And my daily drivers are the Radius sneaker and they have a composite toe on them. But Timberland Pro just released another version which is the Radius knit slip on. Now these are nice because they're flexible and lightweight and they have that same safety toe on them. So they're not going to restrict any movement but they're going to protect your feet. And I love their base plate t-shirts because they are comfortable, they're rugged, and they're moisture wicking. So they're perfect in the shop when you're working up a sweat. So if you're looking for some quality workwear, you can check the links down below in the description and I'll link to some of my favorites. And a big thank you to Timberland Pro for sponsoring today's video. All right, to glue up this monster, I had to roll in my outfeed table and I had to shim it up on a bunch of different wood to get it at the same level. And now I have the width that I need. You can also just go ahead and do it on the floor and just find the flattest spot you can. And after I get the glue on, I will start tightening down the clamps and I'll use a mallet to get all the seams as level and even as possible. So that we'll have just a little cleanup after it's all put together. Look at the size of this thing. This thing is huge. There is so much space here. This is like 36 inches. I don't know what it actually turned out to be. And oh, wow. We're at actually 37 and a half inches. Did I use one more board than I was supposed to? Uh, I do have COVID right now. So um, my brain's a little foggy, but this looks awesome. And uh, now I'm gonna cut it to size. Spill my Mountain Dew. High alert, high alert. Now getting a flat top is super important and I just finished up working on the top with this hand plane and basically it's just knocking down the seams and then using my level just to check where things needed to be lowered and doing that across. Now you can decide how close you want to get that to flat. I am going to try to make it perfect because you know that's kind of the guy I am. Not a perfect guy but the guy who tries to be perfect but is not. You keep digging like this you're going to go straight through to China. Now you could also use a belt sander if you don't have a hand plane. That's an easy way to do it, but it's gonna generate a ton of dust. So you may wanna do that outside. I don't use hand planes a lot and I was getting some tear out where the grain changes directions between boards. So you wanna be careful if you are hand planing, watch out for that. But you can finish off with a hand sander and smooth everything out. And if you have a little bit of tear out here and there, that's okay. But this top is looking great. Now I can move on to working the base. We'll come back later for the dog holes. 
All right, I went ahead and cut all the parts for the base, and I used the same methods through the planer, joiner, and the table saw to get there. And I basically got these to about the same size as a typical two by four, except of course, these look a lot better. Now I do have a few knots in there because uh, I was not as picky on these because they're not gonna be on the top. But I do have these ready for the base and we'll do some assembly. But I cut everything to size using this cut list and I do have plans available if you wanna build your own workbench. I'll have a link down below in the description where you can check those out. But right now I'll get into making the legs which will show how those go together to support the stretchers and the top. So the legs are gonna be two pieces that are gonna be glued together and that will give them a real nice beefy sturdy leg. So here's how the glue gonna work. Uh, this is a full length leg and this is the back side. And then I'm going to glue on two other pieces and it's gonna make the joinery in between them. So one on the top and then one in the middle. And I've got it up on some little scraps here just so I'll have some room to put the clamps on. So I'm gonna go ahead and start gluing these in place and use the spacers to make sure everything's good. Now this is really slippery, so I'm just gonna tack it in place with some two inch knee nails to make sure everything stays where I want it. And I'll repeat the same thing down at this end and I'll use my spacer to position this last one. I'll set this aside to dry and do the rest of it. I've got everything now for the assembly for the side. I went ahead and cut the stretchers to length for the top and the bottom, and these will get attached into the joinery that we made a little bit earlier. But before I do that, I wanna drill some holes in the underside of the top stretcher, and those will be for attaching the base to the top. I'm gonna to go ahead and pre-assemble this, and then I'm gonna drill some pilot holes. Because once you get glue in there, it's kinda of like wrestling a greased pig, and it starts moving all around. So I'm gonna go ahead and pre-drill in the dry fit, and then that way when I put the screws in, it'll just go right back in place where I put it. Everything is screwed together and I did check everything for square, so we are all good. Now I'm gonna do this one section at a time, so I'm just gonna take this one off, put the glue on, and then screw it back down, and then repeat it for the top. And to cover up the screw holes, I'm just gonna plug them with dowels and then flush cut them off. With the size done, we can start to connect it and make the base. And so I cut to size the supports that are gonna go across the top. I also drilled in some pocket hole joints in here so that we can attach them. And that'll allow us to conceal the joinery and give us a nice strong connection. And since I have this nice huge top, I'm gonna use it to assemble the base. I'm gonna go ahead and put this top piece in place to act as a spacer to make sure that everything is nice and square. And before I move on and attach the shelf stretchers there, a quick public service announcement. Uh, if you have two different screw lengths out and you're not gonna use the longer screw length, just go ahead and put that away. Because if you don't, you may end up going through your workpiece and screwing your clamps to the actual workbench. Oh, I put the two and a half inch screws in the two inch screw case. No! <laughs> I have these nice little holes here now in the front. I'm not even gonna fill it. I'm just gonna leave it here because we always need a reminder that mistakes were made, we're not perfect, and uh, we're gonna move on and do the best we can, so. All right, this is the part of the project that I've actually been worried about the most, and that is drilling the bench dog holes. I'm gonna be doing a lot of holes, and I need to make sure that it doesn't hit any of the support pieces on the upper part of the base. 
Also, I don't know how I want to drill them, so I've got a Forstner bit, a spade bit, and a self-driving spade bit. I went out and grabbed one of these. I bought this uh, little drill press attachment for the drills so that it'll make sure that the holes are straight up and down. And I chucked up the bits and I tried each of them on this offcut to see how they cut. Now, the Forstner bit, I tried that one out first and that thing was not cutting at all. It's probably gonna make the cleanest and best hole, but my bit must just be really dull. Now, the second one that I tried out here was the spade bit, and that one actually did pretty well, but the hole was a little bit oversized, and I just didn't like the accuracy of it. Now, the next one, the auger bit, that one's just way too aggressive. It blew out the hole on the top, and I just don't really think I would like that one. So, if I had to pick out of the three, I would go with the spade bit, but I didn't really like any of them. So I went out and bought this, and this is an auger bit that is not self-driving, but is specifically made for cordless drills, and it's supposed to be really clean on the exit holes. So I'm hoping this is gonna be the best solution. And I'll have links to all these items that I use so you can check it out and see exactly what it is. That went really well, almost no blowout, and look at the fit on these. This first one's super loose, the next one was still a little bit loose. This guy, nice and tight. You could just use a tape measure and a grid to mark out the locations of your bench dogs, but I do want to have a perfect 90 degrees so I can use it for clamping up frames and different things. And so I did use my X-Carve CNC to make this template. Now I just went into easel and I made these four inches on center. So there's a three quarter inch holes. But what I also did was I cut a edge on both sides here of this corner to make sure that this was exactly 90 degrees. For the first set of holes, I'm gonna register this on the corner and just clamp it down. I'm gonna make sure that nothing underneath is gonna get hit. Then after I have a few holes in there, I can start using the dog holes to register it as I move down and make the whole series of holes. A whole series of holes. It's gonna get holy up in here. <laughs> All right, I got three rows of holes all the way along the front edge of the bench, and that drill bit is a beast. That thing is amazing. It's working really, really well. Highly recommended. Now at the beginning, I mentioned my old bench had too many holes, and they are three inches on center. So the four inch on center on these is gonna help out. But what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna run another row of three holes on each end and leave a large area on the bench that doesn't have any holes at all. If I wanna add more holes later, I can just grab the template, I'll store this away somewhere, and I can easily add a few more in a few minutes. <laughs> All right. The top's looking great, and I put a little chamfer around each of the bench dog holes just to help to keep them from the edge getting blown out. Now I just need to get this ready for finish, but as I was doing that, our editor Chris came up with an awesome idea, and he said we should put a little customization to it and get a little nameplate for the front. And so I made this. <laughs> Check this out, this is so cool. Since I had the X-Carve already going, I went ahead and pulled our logo into the easel software and carved this out, did a little roughing pass, then switched over to a 60 degree detail bit for all the little details of our logo. Then I backfilled the letters with some Total Boat high performance epoxy, and I used the black, obviously, for the logo and the this and the that, and then the red with a little hint of black to tone it down for the fix and the build. This is so cool, I think it's gonna look awesome on the front of the bench. For the finish, I'm gonna keep it easy and go with an oil-based finish because they're really easy to repair versus a film-based finish like polyurethane. I'm using Rubio Monocoat because it goes on really easy and it dries almost instantly after you wipe off the excess. Goodbye, old friend. And here's a little bit about how I'm gonna use the workbench and some of the design considerations that went into it. First of all, the size of it. This is really nice because now I can fit my 31 inch parallel clamps across there before they would fall off my old bench. Also with the dog holes, there are a lot of different clamping options, whether I wanna put something on its edge, so maybe I can use a block plane on it, or if I wanna have some just dog holes in front to hold a panel in place while I'm sanding or doing any type of other joinery, that's gonna work really well. 
But my favorite way of clamping is using face clamps. And so I left a large overhang all the way around the workbench, the same as my other one. And that allows me to clamp things in place if I'm doing face frames or anything else. And speaking of the top, this thing is so thick and sturdy. It is super heavy, so I can't really move this thing around if I'm banging on it. I did leave the shelf down below open because I am to be adding some modular storage down there. So I'm thinking maybe some drawers, maybe some shelves. But I'd love to hear your ideas. Let me know what your favorite storage method is for a workbench or any ideas that you might have for that. If you want to build your own, I do have plans available. There's a link down below in the description. I want to give a big thank you to those folks that have been joining the FTBT Builders Club. And until next time, guys, get out there and build something awesome.